Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Feles. Thank you, choir, musicians, Bible Baptist Church, for your voices of praise. Be in prayer for our choir. Again, as you know, I have the privilege of providing pastoral care for Bronson Hospital. And we have another opportunity to lead the worship service on next Sunday. And so our choir will be ministering at the Bronson Commons at 2.30. Now, parking is very, very limited. And we're blessed to have Charles Chapman, who's going to drive the choir. Sunday is a big visiting day. And so um, I can tell you not to come, but uh, if you would be in prayer for the choir as a minister, there will also be a time to give the word. Um, we have about an hour slot from 2.30 to 3.30. And this is our second opportunity, uh, March Brother Edward and Sister Phyllis uh, ministered at Bronson, and now our full choir. So be in prayer for the patients and residents and families and staff. That somebody through the ministry of the word, through the ministry of song, might come to salvation in Jesus Christ. That's always the goal. Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's turn to 1 Samuel as we continue our series of Kingdom of Priests, a biblical study of prayer. The outline is provided for you. We've entitled the message, David's Prayer for Guidance. David's Prayer for Guidance. I'm going to read verse 2. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kyla. Father, we thank you for this worship, this privilege we have, all the songs and hymns and prayers and greeting and giving, everything we've done is with you in mind, for we know you're looking for a true worshiper this morning. So now we come and it's a matter of our will. So may our worship continue with will worship, not our will, but thine be done. I'm asking that your word would serve as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Help us to be just, not to be just hearers, but doers of the word. Because every time we choose to do, we, we have an opportunity to show you how much we love you. And as always, may the words of my mouth, the meditation that is in my heart, May it be acceptable into thy sight, O Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. David's prayer of guidance. This is for all of us who are at the brink of making decisions, choices. Some of us need direction for our life. And here we come. We've learned to stay off dead end streets. We're tired of it. Tired of chasing fake rabbits. As the greyhound dog said. He said, well, you gave up. He said, no, I didn't give up. 
I went after that rabbit for my entire life I've been chasing. And I was determined that in this next race, I'm going to get that rabbit. So this dog trained hard. Going to be his last one. And finally, he was in the lead, and he got a hold of that rabbit. Only found out it wasn't real. He said, so I didn't give up. I'm just not going to spend the rest of my life chasing a fake rabbit. I need guidance. You need guidance. And this prayer of David is going to help us as we glean through the scriptures and the study on prayer. It's going to help us, help me, to make better decisions. To see the importance of talking to God about things that we'd like to do, things that we plan to do, goals that we've set for our life. But we certainly want to pray to God. As far back as I can remember, I was thinking in my mind, I've always had this love for geography and navigation. I, where does it come from? And I could think, I was thinking to... One of my teachers, it was either third or fourth grade, Mrs. Miller. And I wasn't too good at finding out north, south, east, and west. I, I just couldn't get it. I saw it, but I, I couldn't remember it. I, so I test, I'm going south when I should be going north, and I'm going west when I should be going east. And I remember she said to me, she said, if you just remember news... Just remember news. The N is north. The E is east. The W is west. And the S is south. A light went on in my mind. From that point on, I have loved geography, navigation. I'm telling you. I love sitting down. My family will tell you, one of the things I like is sitting down and looking at an atlas. I could do it for a couple of hours. I used to plan our trip. Rand McNally, we tight. I like the atlas. That 25, 30 mile scale that's there, oh, I would map out our trips. My wife would tell me, she said, you know, AAA will do that for us. All we have to do is send them a notice and they'll send you a trip ticket. They'll give you the whole thing. I don't need AAA. <laughs> that was before I understood that God gave me a help meet, somebody that's going to help me what I don't have. So I've learned matured since then. But I don't, want, I don't need AAA. I'm going to figure this thing out for myself. So I would sit down and map out our whole trips because I want direction. I need to know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm planning. We went to California and uh, I mapped the whole trip out. And so we flew in L.A. and the kids, we're going to drive them down the coast. They were like, how do you know that? I said, we're we going to take a run down to San Diego. They said, Dad, how are we going to do that? Are we going to be able to get back? I said, listen, I didn't map this out. I know how many miles it is. We're going down to San Diego. We're going to spend a couple of days. We're going to drive back to Los Angeles. We're just having a good time because I like studying these maps. I have read the history of the compass. There is a true north. Yes, there is. All navigation is, is based upon that. But I also can remember finding direction. I'm appreciative of the truckers. I remember I had the CB radio. Citizen Band Radio. My handle was Rev Olution. <laughs> yes. Yes. You all know my daughter's a poet, right? Some of you been to her performances? When she says, I'd like to give a shout out to Revolution, she's talking about me. You all didn't know that. <laughs> Ask her. She'll tell you, that was my handle. I appreciate the truckers because remember, they, 
they would help us with direction on the CB radio. You learned what Checkpoint Charlie meant. You, 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 Evil Knievel. When you hear Evil Knievel, you know that there was a troop on a motorcycle coming up. You learned to pay attention to that. Gumball machine. You knew what that meant. There's a police car with a cherry on top coming up. You knew what that was. Excuse me, ladies, Miss Piggy, that means there was a female officer. We grew from that. She became Mama Bear. Papa Bear was the male. You remember these things. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Kojak with a Kodak. That meant there's a trooper taking pictures up there. 10-4, agreement, 10-10. I'm just listening. You remember that? 1020, give me my location. 1036, what's the time? Breaker, breaker, one nine. <laughs> Listen, I'm getting ready to transmit on channel 19. Yes, you all knew what it means to have the CB. Helping us find direction, these truckers. Richard Kirshner, though, taking technology from World War II. A group of scientists monitoring Russian Sputnik satellite using the Doppler effect. Sound, waves, they were able to measure where that Sputnik went. And from that, you and I have the global positioning system, or GPS. We've learned to depend on it. Help us with direction. I was slow to it because I still want to keep my Rand McNally. My wife, again, my help me, God give me what I don't have, saying we need GPS. We don't need no GPS. I got my atlas. Only to find out but the atlas won't tell you that there's a lane blocked. There's a quicker way. Can't get that from the atlas. So now I've become a fan. Finally, after studying the compass, sitting down with my maps, rejecting AAA, GPS. Oh, I thank God for the GPS. I realized 30 satellites, almost 12,000 miles circling the earth at the speed of light connected to our receiver can give us direction. I want to tell you about one more, and I'm going to call it the G-O-D. G-O-D. God's omnipotent direction. God's omnipotent direction. You got to have it for your life. I got to have it for my life. Guaranteed to get you to the right place. David was someone who would spend his life making decisions only after he would inquire of the Lord. Verse 2 and verse 4 in our text. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? Verse 4, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise and go to Kilah. For I will deliver the Philistines into thy hands. The word inquire simply means to ask, to request. That when you and I, we are ready to make a decision. If you're here today and you know I've got to make a major decision. Maybe there's a time issue. You've got to make a decision. Maybe you're thinking about a, a different location. Maybe you're thinking about a different job. Maybe you're thinking about marriage. Maybe you're thinking about whether or not we're going to have children. These are major decisions, and David is teaching us this morning 
that we don't want to make these choices without asking God. We don't want to make these, these choices without requesting and spending time inquiring of God before we make the choice. We have a history, don't we? We know what it's like making decisions without talking to God, how much trouble I've got into, how much trouble you've got into. And we're living in grace for some of our decisions because we know that even though I made the wrong choice, God still loves me. God is still gracious to me and he's allowing me to live within my choice. But David is teaching us how to make better choices. I always wondered, where did this come from? He certainly didn't make a good choice with Bathsheba. We know that. But where does David get the idea? Where does it come from him within himself to know that as a warrior, I have the responsibility of soldiers in my hand. I'm not going to battle without talking to God. And I'm only going to go if God assures me that there's going to be victory. He's not going to even pretend that the victories last week are going to assure him for victories this week. I'm not going to fight these Philistines until God says that I can go. That's what it means to inquire. Where did it come from? I believe if we come back to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, that David got this as he was a shepherd. This was way before he became King David. This is when he was just Pastor David. This is when he had the responsibility of the care of the sheep. In verse 32, he is preparing to fight Goliath. And as he is preparing to fight Goliath, he gives us some insight about things that have happened in his life. Things certainly where you don't want to Go after these things without talking to God to be assured that God is going to give you deliverance. Verse 32 of 1 Samuel 17. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth. And he's a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear, took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servants slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. You would have never thought when they were looking for a soldier. Surely Jesse's other sons were warriors. David was not even considered. They made fun of him, his older brothers. He brought food to the war. They talked about him and said, you just want to see us fight. That's the only reason why you're here. And David would say, is there not a cause? He understood where God was. He had learned to talk with God and to inquire of God. You have to be able to talk to God if your decision, your choice, your, your inquiry for the day. My decision for the day is to chase down this lion. My decision for the day is to chase down this bear. You're going to chase a lion, you're going to chase a bear. You better be prayed up before you do so. I'm just going to tell you that right now. We had a little dog. This little dog was colors. I, I, I was determined. I told my family, I said, look, we're not getting another dog. That's it. Don't even, I don't even want, well, let's just go look at it, Dad. No, ain't no need to go in and look. Because we ain't getting no other dog. Because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be the one taking the dog out at night. I'm going to have to do all this. No, uh-uh, we done. Well, this, we, it ain't going to hurt to go look. So we went out to this farm. And there were these little Maltese. One male left. All I did was rub the dog's head. Little baby. Dog followed me all over the farm. 
Man. I said, let's get the checkbook. We got to take him home. <laughs> I just keep him in my, I had a big roll pocket. He was in the roll pocket. He stick his head out like I'm a kangaroo or something. He stick his head out. And then he would sit, I sit in the chair, but then he would let nobody, somebody come there. He wanted, but he was a little thing, just a little, little Maltese, a cute little thing. His name, his name my family named him Cuddles. I told him, I said, look, we're going to have to change that name because we're going to go, he's going to go out with these shepherds and these Rockwilers and all of that. They, they ma major, sergeant, you see. And I'm coming out with little cuddles. We're going to have to change that name. We're going we're to name him Monster or something. We're going to have to. People would come to the house and uh, I tell them we had a man come from Sears to, to repair the refrigerator. I said, hold up before you come in. Let me put my dog up. He was like, oh, please, please do. And I said, get back, get back. Well, when he saw that little Maltese run out of there, he was laughing. But you know what? We give that dog a bone. I could not take that bone out that dog's mouth. Can you imagine a lion and a bear coming into the sheepfold, stealing a lamb, and David chase down the lion, grabs him by the beard, and recovers the lamb for the sheepfold. Now that's a pastor for you. It's not this pastor, but it is a pastor <laughs> who's going to chase down a lion and chase down a bear. Now I'll leave 99 and come after you, but there's some things I'm just not going to do. And guess what? He recovered them. You better be prayed up if you're going to do something like that. David learned as a shepherd about what it means to inquire of God. David learn as a shepherd what it means to be able that I'm not going and chasing anything. I'm not going after anything except for I'm going to inquire of God. So here David now is king. David is a warrior. He now has experience. He's got victories behind him. But he's not presumptuous in thinking. Because what will happen is, I'll gain more confidence in myself. And God wants us to regularly, daily, moment by moment, depending upon him. And so David inquires. Now, I don't want to bypass some key things in the text. Kyla or Kyla means citadel. And citadel would be the last defense that we have for our protection. It's citadel. If this is the last defense and we lose that, we're vulnerable to all of the enemies. His men are afraid. They understand what this is. Look at what they say in verse 3. And David's men said to him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. We're here. How much more then if we come to Kila against the armies of the Philistines? This is the citadel. This is the last defense that we have. And they're getting ready to take the threshing floor. The threshing floor. A lot of spiritual lessons about the threshing floor. This round, hard surface in the ground, usually elevated a little bit. Think about it, there's no machinery, per se. And the goal and the task was to be able to separate the wheat from the tares. 
to separate the grain from the chaff so they would lay it on the threshing floor. The oxen would walk upon it to break it up. They knew at certain times that there would be a wind passing through. And they would use what would be called a winnowing fork. They would take, after the oxen had broke it all up, take the winnowing fork, throw it up in the air, and the wind would separate the chaff, and the grain would fall back to the threshing floor. God talks a lot about separating the chaff from the grain, the chaff from the wheat. The wind would blow away all that wasn't edible, and the only thing that would fall to the ground was simply that which you could eat. This was only done annually at harvest time. Only time it could be done. You miss that opportunity, you're going to have to wait till next year. So you can imagine somebody going to rob the threshing floor. This is your sustenance for the rest of the year. This is serious. Hard for us to understand because we can run the miles. But what if the door was locked? We couldn't get in. Couldn't go to Walmart. You see, couldn't go to Harding's. Couldn't even go on that tough day to the gas station and get that loaf of bread. Or the dollar store. Something about that bread, though, isn't it? It just don't seem to, when you put the peanut, what? But in a tough day, sometimes that's all you got. What if you couldn't have all of that? You can imagine then, they're going to take our last defense. They're going to rob our sustenance for the year. And all this was happening at Kilo. Verse 23, verse 1, then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kyla, and they rob the threshing floor. You get a sense now of the urgency of this? But David inquires of the Lord, Shall I go? The Lord said, Go. Verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord yet again, And the Lord answered him and said, arise and go. Verse five, so David and his men went to Kilah and fought with the Philistines. Brought away their cattle, smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Kilah. And it came to pass when Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Kilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now I want you to think about this. David is inquiring of the Lord. Abathar is a priest. The ephod was part of the garments of the priest. Twelve stones on the front, one representing each tribe of Israel, but it also contained the Urim and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim. It was through the Urim and the Thummim that God would often answer the direction for the kings. When they would inquire of the priests, it would often be through the Urim and the Thummim that was on the garment of the ephod that the priest would have that God would send what his will was going to be. Isn't that amazing? So the priest comes with the assurance that God is going to continue to give you the guidance that you need as king. Let me say this to you, as I say to myself, how important that it is to inquire of God when I'm getting ready, when you're getting ready 
to make a decision. Proverbs tells me that 3, 5, and 6, what does it say? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not what? To your own understanding. In all of thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct thy pathway. That's vital. That, that is important. And the idea is simply leaning. Leaning on a crutch. Leaning on a piece of wood to hold you up. Brother, Brother Lockhart was at the picnic uh, yesterday. And I had a good, good chance to talk with him. Um, thank you, Brother Carter and some of the other men uh, concerned about him. Took him fishing which was wonderful. Thank you, Deacon, for doing that. They were concerned about him. You know he had a stroke and he's recovering, he's taking his voice, but also something with the balance. He had his, his cane and he's, he said, I need it in order to, to get my balance. I need it. Same word, same idea when Proverbs says leaning. Don't, don't depend on your understanding. Don't use your understanding as a crutch for guidance. He said, you trust in me with all your heart. Don't lean to your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me and I'm going to direct your pathway. That, that means sovereignly that you and I can be confident in making good decisions and good choices when we acknowledge God in our plan. Nothing wrong with making a plan. As James says, come now ye that say today, tomorrow, we're going to go into a city. We're going to continue there for a year. We're going to buy. We're going to sell. We're going to get gain. He said, but what you ought to say is if the Lord will. We do this or that. Nothing wrong with making a plan. But I have to acknowledge God. Lord, this is, this is what I would like to do, Lord. This is, this is what I'm thinking. But it's not so much what I'm thinking. It's, it's more important, Lord, what your will is for my life. So I'm acknowledging you with it. I, 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 I want you to lead me in the way that I should go and then I have the confidence to make decisions because in what we call the Lord's Prayer, God ain't going to lead us to no temptation. He ain't going to hold us between two opinions. I put two roads. Let me see which way you're going to go. Oh, you messed up. No. My father wants to lead me. He wants me to follow him. So he's not going to hold me in confusion. You acknowledge me. I'm going to direct you. We also understand that morally speaking, I, I don't know what the sovereign will of God is until it happens. So how will he guide me in this life then? How, how do I know moment to moment decisions? Well, in Psalm 119, 105, it says that that the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. That God has given me his moral word. That I can hear from God every day and make decisions and choices based on what he has said. I don't always have to, as people say, I need a word from the Lord. No, I just want to do what he's already said. And what he said was, is in his word, that it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. So how do I do the things that I have? I, I, I am a husband. I am, I, God has given me his, his lamp and his light on what I'm supposed to do as a husband. God has, I, I'm a son. What has God given me? I'm to honor my mother. So... I want to do what his word says, and when I do what his word says, then I, I know I'm, I'm following God based on his word. I'm, I'm a brother. I'm a pastor. I'm a friend. All of these things. I have finances. I, all these areas of my life, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And when I'm doing what he says... I can be assured that God is guiding me in the right direction. 
John 8, 12 says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God wants us to walk in the light as he is in the light. So when I'm following the words and the life of Jesus, using him as Proverbs says, as, and, and also as Ephesians says, that that he is the measure of the stature. I can follow you, you can follow me, but you only follow me and I follow you as we follow Christ. That if I'm following him, he's the measure of my life. He's the standard. Because you're going to fail me at some point. I'm going to fail you at some point. He ain't going to never fail me. So I keep my eyes on him. He's the author and finisher. I'm the light of the world. And then finally, I think it's important for us to understand that, that I can't know the sovereign will until it happens. I have the moral will of God, his word, to make decisions every day. Following Jesus' life. Is more than just a banner, what would Jesus do? But it's his life. But I also have the freedom, the liberty to make decisions. I think that's vital. I think it's what we forget. I hear people saying, Pastor, pray for me, I'm going to buy a car. And I'm praying on what God's will is for the color. What's your favorite color? Blue? Get a blue one. You have the freedom to be able to do that. I think we forget the liberty that we have in Christ. Romans 14 tells me doubtful disputations. I have so much liberty to make so many decisions based on my enjoyment, based on as long as they're not outside of God's word. You think about it. What did he do? He placed... Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden said, you know what, every tree you may freely, you got the freedom to just, you ain't got to ask me, to, am I going to eat this tree or that tree? You got freedom, just don't eat that one. Because in the day you eat of that one, you're going to surely die. But outside of that, you got, you got so much freedom. And I think we miss that liberty in Christ. When we were raising our kids, we, we, we didn't, emphasize the liberties more so than the restrictions. I remember telling my kids back then, I said, look, I don't want Michael Jackson's name mentioned in our house. I was not balanced, trust me. My kids asked if they could go to a party a couple doors down. We said, yeah, you, you guys can go, nice neighbors and so forth. All of a sudden, my wife and I are in the back room, and we hear, go, Kevin, go, Kevin, go, Kevin. My son was doing all kind of <laughs> Michael Jackson stuff. I was like, and we laughed. But what about all this other good music you can listen to? We just, we just didn't f emphasize the liberties. It was... Always a restriction. That's the same thing that Satan does in the garden. He, he got them to, to take their eyes off of all the freedom and the enjoyment that God wants for them. And he got them to focus on the one thing that God says, don't eat of. Isn't that amazing? And sometimes my parenting, our parenting was that way. Maybe your parenting has been that way. And so our kids grew up thinking, man, we can't do nothing. There's nothing for us to do in the body of Christ. There's no enjoyment. There's no, no fun. We can't, we, we can't do nothing. Listen, my kids, my sons played peewee football. They, my son, Kevin's team, he got a jacket. Ask him to show you. He said, 11 and 0. He said, Dad. He said, we in the championship game. It was on Sunday. I said, you ain't, you ain't playing the championship game, son. He said, why? He said, because it's on Sunday. That's the Lord's Day. We're going to serve the Lord, me and my house. 
So we, they, didn't, they didn't play in the championship game. Only for me to leave church, go home and watch football. What we discovered is that a lot of the things that we put for them in restriction of choices just simply were not balanced. We, we forgot about the liberties and the freedoms that God has given to us as believers to make choices based on what you like and what you don't like as long as it's not outside of God's word and what he says. We, we have even in marriage, he tells you, look at what he says, that, that when a husband or wife passes away, you got freedom to marry whoever. But what? In the Lord. That's it. You know how much freedom that is? Wow. That's a lot of freedom. And so God wants us to be in the place of his choosing, of his will. God wants to guide us so much and so that he has given within us a built-in tracking the Holy Spirit. God has provided God's omnipotent direction. But what he wants from me is to inquire, to talk with him, to ask him, to acknowledge him. And he has given me a promise that he will direct my pathway. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great that we have that? It's, that's, that's a wonderful thing to have. I'm, I'm so thankful for that, that God has that for me. It may mean difficulty, may even bring problems. But just because you make a decision, and maybe you've made a decision, and you found yourself in the storm. But that doesn't necessarily mean Jesus ain't in the boat. Trust me. Ask me. David, Lord, shall we go up? Go. Lord, we going up? Go. He tell the men, let's go. God then gave us the victory already. Let's go. And that's exactly what happens. You'll see when God would tell him, don't go. I haven't given them to you, and David won't go. He's got the lives of men who have families. Women and children are, are depending upon this king. You're not going to make decisions frivolously, no. And same thing with you. Parents, you have your children. Husbands, you have your wives. Wives, you have your husbands. Some of us, we're raising our grandchildren right now. Their future is in front of us. We got difficulty in the world today, like no other time. Oh, we need to make sure we're following God's omnipotent direction. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We're thankful for this series on prayer. What I'm learning what we're learning as a church. And today we see an experienced warrior, King David, so successful that his son will be able to build your house. And it says, because David would have put down all the enemies, Solomon simply had no one else to fight. Because his father 
was successful as God's warrior. But it wasn't in his own wisdom. It wasn't even in his own strategy. It wasn't even in his own efforts. David simply learned a key of life when he was a young pastor. Caring for the sheep. He learned that you don't chase down bears and lions on your own. You don't grab a lion by the beard, a bear by his hair. You don't take food out of the mouth of a lion and a bear without learning to depend and trust and the guidance of God. So when it comes to the giant, he's got a history now. Oh, I know how to slay the giant. I'm going to talk to God about it. And so help me as a pastor making decisions and choices every day. As a husband and father, son, a friend, a brother, I just want wise decisions for my life. I pray the same for my wife and my children, my grandchildren. I pray the same for my brothers and sisters in Christ sitting here today Help our families and help our marriages, help our, those of us who are caring for our grandchildren now. The world seems to be in maze. Our leaders don't seem to know where they're going. But Father, you've assured us today that if we inquire, You'll show us the way. We thank you for that. Thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. Ever present, always present. To lead us in the way we go. And as Moses says that God, if you're going, we want to go. But if you're not going, we don't want to go. So as you led by the cloud and the pillar fire, that's what we want in our life. So help us. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But as Paul says, I know who I have believed in. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's our prayer, Lord. We humbly bow before you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, every head is bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. There might be someone here today you've never, ever, ever trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. God loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. We invite you to come. We'll take you to the Word and show you how to be saved. Maybe you're here, you're already a Christian, you, you don't have a church home. We love to have you in our family here at Bible Baptist Church. We'll teach you about our history, what we believe, take you through discipleship, and hopefully find a place of service for you. Or maybe you're already here, you're a member of this church or another church, you just, you've been listening to the message and now you're in a place of prayer. We got some wonderful prayer warriors. You don't have to be a member here. You just want somebody to pray with you. They'd be happy to pray with you about any area of your life. Let's all stand.